want to share with you a, uh, a message. Actually, uh, a few weeks ago, about, uh, I don't know, a month ago or so, the Lord gave me this little word about small things. I shared it with his house at um, their chapel service. They had asked me to share. And, um, you know, we're kind of in that place between Christmas and New Year's, kind of the uh, no man's land. And I really feel like this message, that really resonates with me. And I think it'll resonate uh, with you as well. And it's talking about the day of small things. As we get ready to go into the new year and we make our New Year's resolutions, we think about the year that is coming and we usually focus on the big vision, the big goals that we have. And sometimes we'll miss some of the most important things that is going on in our life in the uh, daily aspect. And so first of all, I want to look at the small. Uh, April, if you could put that up there. And a letter A, do not despise the day of small things. It says in Zechariah 4.10, who despises the day of small things? You know, think about last week. We had Christmas. And Christmas started out as a small event. You know, it was just Mary and Joseph in the manger. There were the shepherds out in the field by night. The three wise men. And basically, that's all the people who knew about that very first Christmas. Celebrated that first Christmas. Imagine it in this stable, in this manger, in this barn, a cave, whatever it was, it was so small and insignificant. But look at how it has grown. I mean, it's got to be one of the largest, I would say it, it is the largest event every year. How many billions and billions of dollars are spent? And it's not just a day, it's a whole season. You got the Christmas season, and you got shows and all kinds of things that are covering Christmas. But it just started out as a very small thing. You know, I wonder if the innkeepers knew who they were saying no to that night when they saw this young peasant couple, a man and this greatly uh, expecting wife there at the door, and they said, hey, there's no room at the inn. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews 13 too, do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some people have entertained angels and not even knew it. Something that just passed by. Those angels must not have appeared to be of anything great or significant, and we just kind of pass it by. Everything in the kingdom of God starts as a small thing, as a mustard seed. You know, it's one of the things that God created, I think, to show us. One of the smallest seeds that God creates, but it turns out to be one of the largest plants. So big that birds can nest on the branches of these plants. It starts out very small, but it grows and it takes over. It envelops. It just continues to expand. And it consumes and envelops everything. You know, when I got saved... I had no idea how that was going to change my life. Now, I knew I was crying out to the Lord. I needed a, a Savior. I needed peace. I needed joy. I needed the Lord. And so the Lord comes into my life, and I thought, well, praise God. He's, you know, he, he saved me. He's given me peace. I have this um, peace that passes all understanding. And I just assumed that when I die, I'll go to heaven, and I was just going to kind of live my life you know, till I got to heaven. And I didn't realize that it just continued to grow. And it began to expand. It began to envelop and take over and consume my life. Had no idea that it would become the passion that it is. That it would uh, drive me into ministry. The desire to uh, want to spread the gospel. And that's the way the things are in the kingdom of God. They start out small. They start like a seed. But they just continue to grow, to consume, to envelop us. And that's the way the spirit of God is. So do not despise the day 
of small things because nothing is small with God. As big as this universe is, as big as all the creation is, the Bible says that God sees every sparrow that falls. We were in uh, Disney last weekend. And you know, uh, uh, there were a bunch of little sparrows flying around. I hadn't seen sparrows in a long time. They are itty bitty things. I mean, they're about that big from head to tail. And those little sparrows, Jesus said they're sold for a few pennies. But not one of them falls to the ground. Not one of them dies without our Father's knowledge. Without our Father's eyes seeing them. There are things that we totally ignore. We wouldn't think twice about. But God himself sees, knows, and thinks about it. He says that every hair on your head is numbered. He knows every hair on your head and he has it numbered. God is intimately aware of each and every one of us. You remember the widow's might. I mean, just the smallest of offering. Yet, in that big temple with all the people putting in the big dollars into the uh, money bags, Jesus saw this lady with a few copper coins, putting them in there, and he stopped and he recognized her. He said, you know what? She's putting in more than all the rest because she's giving out of all that she has. Her faith and her trust was in her heavenly Father. How God stopped and saw her heart and saw what she was doing. The widow's might does not pass the eyes of God. He even said that even a cold cup of water given in my name, something that most of us wouldn't even think about, in a, even a cold cup of water, he will not lose his reward. Can you imagine? God sees all the little things. He sees all the details, things that most of us wouldn't even think about. Recognize In Psalms 147.4, he says this, He, God, determines the number of stars and calls them each by name. You think about the billions and trillions of stars that are out there. We get our big Hubble telescopes and all those things, and we're, you know, canvassing the whole universe, and we're tracking and we're naming all these galaxies and the stars that we can find. And they're stars that we haven't even discovered yet. And one day when we discover them, guess what? God has already named them. He's already created them. It is amazing that nothing escapes the attention of Almighty God. God knows the names of those stars that we haven't seen or even discovered yet. And Jesus said this, he calls each of his sheep by name. You know what? If you're his child, he knows you by name. I was saved for several years, and one day that revelation just hit my heart. I mean, it really did. Wow, God knows my name. You know, I thought that maybe my prayers going up to heaven, God doesn't know. There are billions of people up there and uh, prayers going and, you know, God's just so busy with all the things going on. But you know what? He knows each of us by name. If you ever feel lonely, if you ever feel like, well, you know, nobody hears me. Nobody knows what's going on in my life. God knows. God cares. That's how personal our God is. And so, when God's heart is really beating inside of you, it will draw you to the little things. It will draw you to the things that other people may not notice. I want to look at letter B. Jesus said this, and I want you to turn to Luke chapter 9. He said, the least among you, he is the greatest. Now something was going on. Jesus if you can imagine and picture in your mind's eye, here's Jesus. He's got his 12 disciples with him. And he picked the people that were, you know, kind of the misfit toys. 
He didn't get the wise and the learned. He didn't go from the great priests and the Pharisees and the Levites and all of those. He went and he picked fishermen and tax collectors and just the common ordinary folk that the religious leaders look down upon. You know, there was a pecking order. There's always a pecking order. Doesn't matter where you go. You go into the office place, there is a pecking order in there. You go to, you know, even if you're in jail, you know, the, the prisoners, there's always this pecking order of people that are up, down, and the bottom. And so these guys were at the bottom of the pecking order. And you know what happened? Now, this is the church. They started creating their own pecking order. You see, that's not the way the kingdom of God works. That's where the enemy tries to get in, tries to begin to divide. In verse 10 of chapter 9, in Luke, the ninth uh, chapter, verse 10, it said, when the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus, Oh, let's see, I, that's not the uh, verse I was looking for. I was look, looking for verse 48, I'm sorry. An argument, okay, talking about division. What does it start with? Starts with an argument. Ever been a part of an argument? I mean, today or before. You know, it just begins. An argument started among the disciples as to which of them was the greatest. And James and John thought that they would be the greatest. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts. Now think about that. Here it is at a critical time in the birth and the growth of the church. You have these guys and an argument is already starting. The enemy has already got his foot in the door. He's working in the hearts of the disciples. The enemy is working 24-7 in your life. Wherever you work, your neighbors, your friends, your family, and the church, he's always trying to get in, and he's always trying to elevate. And this was happening with the apostles. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, he took a little child and had him stand beside him. Do you get that picture? There's a little child around there, and he says, son, come here, stand beside me. And then he addresses his disciples. And he says this, whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me, referring to his father. For he who is least among you, he is the greatest. So he has this little child and he says, very important lesson here. The one that is the least is the most important among you. The one who serves is greater than the one who is being served. Do you think they got the message? After three and a half years, you see, once you've determined your own greatness, you'll never stoop to wash feet. The very last thing that Jesus did on the night that he was betrayed, the Lord's Supper, they all got together in the upper room and the servant who was supposed to be there to wash their feet wasn't there. And they all kind of knew that, you know, this happens every time you get into the room and somebody washes your feet, get all that dust and everything off, but there was nobody there and nobody was going to be the first to do it. And so finally after supper, Jesus stands up, he takes off his outer cloak and he begins to wash their feet. You see, when our significance is so important, we'll never stoop to do those things. But Jesus himself got down to wash his disciples' feet, to show them how they should serve, how they should love one another. You know, it was the pride of life that destroyed one of the most magnificent, gifted angels that God ever created. That was Lucifer. Lucifer was not created to be the scumbag that he is today. Lucifer was created to worship. He was the greatest. He was the most beautiful. He had the most angelic voice. He led the choirs, the heavenly hosts, if you can imagine. And at some point he decided, you know, I would like to be worshipped just like 
God is being worshipped. I want to be exalted just like God is being exalted. And that pride of life got into his heart and that began to destroy him. Being the greatest, it destroys nations, it destroys homes, it destroys churches and ministries, it'll destroy men and women of all race, all creed, all colors. It's no respecter of persons. When that pride gets into your heart and it begins to elevate, you'll begin to see a change in the relationships around you. It'll begin to separate. It'll begin to divide. That's how the enemy works himself in destroying you and destroying the body of Christ. A house divided cannot stand against itself. And so Jesus addresses his disciples. Those who are the least will be the greatest. John the Baptist, who was considered the greatest man uh, born of woman, he said this, that he must increase and I must decrease. Let me tell you what the cure is from that spirit of pride, wanting to be the greatest. And that cure is that we are not spending enough time in the presence of God. If you spend enough time in the presence of God, you will see how holy He is. You'll see how uh, righteous and loving and everything that God is. And it will just put everything else in perspective. Isaiah, one of the great prophets of the Old Testament, one of the greatest men of his age, he was in the presence of God in a dream or a vision, but he was in the throne room of God. And he said this in Isaiah 6, 5. He said, woe to me. I'm undone. I'm unclean. I'm a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the Lord. The God Almighty. When you get into the presence of God, it puts everything in perspective. As we get into His presence, it'll balance everything out in our lives. The kingdom of God is all about small things. It's about those things that we miss. There was a time when Jesus was uh, there was a crowd. There was always a crowd. He was like a rock star. There was a crowd everywhere that he went. And there was this uh, high priest. His name was Jairus. His daughter was dying. And so he came. He fell at Jesus' feet. He said, please, come. Heal my daughter. She's about to die. And so Jesus is going to go. And if you can picture this scene, all these people are crowding around him. And all of a sudden, in the middle of this, he stops. And he looks around and he said, someone touched me. And Peter's like, are you nuts? <laughs> Everybody's touching you. I mean, you know, he's just, they're being packed. And he said, no, somebody has touched me. And he starts looking to find out who that person is. And this woman, for 12 years, she was dealing with this issue of blood. She spent all she had. She went to doctors. Nothing could heal her. Nothing could help her. And she was there, maybe somewhere in the back of that crowd, and she thought to herself, if only, you know, I could get a hold of Jesus for a moment. If I could talk to him and explain my situation, and she, you know, very private matter. I, I really don't want everybody to know. But she was thinking, you know, I, I, can't, I can't get him alone, but if I could just touch the hem of his garment... I know that I could be healed. And so she works her way into that crowd. She grabs the hem of his garment. And the Spirit of God came on her and healed her. And what happened was that she touched Jesus by faith. And he knew immediately that something had happened. Now let me tell you, whenever you touch the Lord by faith... He has, you have his attention. You've come into the presence of God. Nobody who touches God by faith, God misses, overlooks. The problem is not that trying to get through to the throne room of heaven. It's really more about 
God getting a hold of us, getting a hold of our hearts. You see, out of that whole multitude and crowd, nobody was really touching Jesus by faith except this woman. And once she did, she had the Lord's attention. Now that's not the exception to the rule. That is the rule. There was a guy by the name of blind Bartimaeus in Luke chapter 18. Here's this blind guy. And there's this crowd. They're going to Jerusalem. And uh, you, can you imagine? Several hundred people, you know, following Jesus, this big crowd going to Jerusalem, and all the chatter that's going on, like this big party that's happening. And here's blind Bartimaeus, and he's asking, hey, what's going on? What's the big commotion? I mean, the guy cannot see. And they said, well, Jesus, Jesus is coming through. And so what he decided to do, he wanted to be healed. So from where he was, he starts crying out to Jesus. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. In verse 38 of chapter 18, he called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he's crying out. He's trying to get over the crowd. And, you know, it's like... You know, when the baby starts crying in the middle of dinner or the middle of a restaurant or wherever it is, I mean, everybody hears it right away. And so the guy was being a little bit annoying, to be honest with you. And it says this in verse 29 or 39, those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he said he shouted all the more. This is my one chance. I may never see again. I don't know where he's at, but he just starts crying out even louder. And he, through all the noise, got to Jesus because he was crying out by faith. And so it says that Jesus stopped. Everything that was happening, he stopped and he ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus told him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. And Jesus said, receive your sight. Why? Your faith has healed you. And immediately he received his sight, followed Jesus, praising God. With all the people saw it, they also began to praise God. Here he was. He touched Jesus by faith. Whenever you touch Jesus by faith, he hears you. And if we know that he hears us, we have the requests which we've asked of him. When Jesus was dying on the cross, now imagine this. I mean, this is the most monumental moment in human history. You know, darkness has covered the clouds. Jesus is taking the the weight of all sin and humanity on his shoulders. He's there. He's uh, you know, just beaten and bloodied and, you know, the picture and the scene that's going on there. You know, have you ever been just overwhelmed? Have you ever been to your uh, boiling point, to where you're having the meltdown, you know, and you just want to withdraw from everything and everyone? Well, if there was a point in Jesus' life where there would be the meltdown, it would be right here. And here it is, the thief on the, on the right, you know, calling out to Jesus. And I could imagine, you know, if it was me, it's like, you know, I'm kind of busy right now. I'm here, I'm saving the world from the sins and all the other things that are going on. And yet, in the midst of that, this thief touched Jesus by faith. He said, Lord, have mercy on me. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what did Jesus say? In the midst of all of this, he said, today, you will be with me in paradise. If that's how Jesus acted while he was here on earth, how is he acting now in heaven at the right hand of Father? It says in Matthew 7, 25, therefore, Jesus is able to save completely all who come to him because he always lives to make intercession for them. God hears the cries of his children. They don't go on deaf ears. If he sees every sparrow that falls, he sees you. He sees me. He sees the needs that are going on in my life. But too often we 
pass it by. You know, Jesus gave the parable of the Good Samaritan. And the first one to come by was a religious leader. He was a Levite. And it said he just passed him by on the other side. And then came a priest. And he was walking alongside. And he passed him by. There's so many opportunities that we just pass by what God has in store for us. It wasn't until the Samaritan, who was represented by Jesus himself, came along and ministered to him. This is what it says in Matthew 25, in verse 42. He says, For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger, needing clothes or sick or in prison, and did not help you? And he will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. You see, when God's Spirit is speaking to us, and he just kind of puts it on our heart, you know, you need to go help so-and-so. You need to kind of stop and just minister to whatever. The Holy Spirit is working on you, but it's such a small thing, and we just pass it by. We don't give it a second thought. We just miss the opportunities that God puts in front of us. I don't know about you, but that's really convicting to me. You know, you can raise your whole family, and so often we miss what God is doing in the midst of that, and all the busyness. You know, we become the Martha and not the Mary that sits at Jesus' feet, and all these opportunities we begin to miss. So as we are faithful in the small things, and if you want a clue to find where the presence and the kingdom of God, it's in those small things. And as we're faithful in the small things, they lead to the big and significant things. It is that still, small voice that speaks to us. It is, be still and know that I am God. It leads us, the small things, to the big significant things in our lives. I want to look at the second point. Look at the significant. Where Jesus, and I want us to turn to John chapter 4, I want to look at the story of the woman at the well. And he said to his disciples, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are white unto harvest. So Jesus is... comes to a very significant ministry event and it starts out as something very trivial, something insignificant, seemed like a random event that was occurring, but it really was not. And in verse 6, they're heading through Samaria and it says this, Jesus, uh, they were at Jacob's well there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. It was noon. So you got that picture. Jesus, tired as he was. I didn't know that Jesus ever got tired. You know, the Bible says that God never sleeps or slumbers, but Jesus in his physical body, he was tired. He wanted to rest. And so while he's there resting, it says in verse 7, a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. So it's just Jesus and this woman. And the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. So first we see that Jesus is tired. And secondly, it's kind of a culturally awkward situation. This Samaritan woman comes up to this Jewish man sitting by the well, and there's already a wall built up. She was not expecting him to talk to her, nor was she going to talk to him. And Jesus could have just 
let this one go by because he was tired, because it was culturally awkward, but he engages her. In today's climate of racial tensions, it is the heart of Christ. It is the love of Christ that is going to bridge the gaps. We're not going to be able to legislate. We're not going to be able to create laws. Any political mandates are going to break down these walls. It is only the love of Christ that breaks down all the tensions, all the barriers. Jesus began to break down these walls. So why would you suppose that Jesus would engage this woman? And I think the answer is what Jesus gave when he was 12 years old, when he was lost, or at least lost from Mary and Joseph for three days. They find him in the temples, and they said, hey, where you been? He says, did you not know I must be about my father's business? He was always about his father's business. While he's sitting at the well, he's tired, and the woman is coming up, and the Spirit is speaking to him and says, you need to engage her. He got about his father's business. And he began to engage this woman. He talks to her about worship. He talks to her about um, you know, uh, living water and those things. And in verse 27, the disciples returned. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want, or why are you talking with her? And I want you to stop and see that these disciples, if it was them sitting at the well, nothing would have happened. She would have came, got her water, they would have looked the other way. Does anybody do that here in South Florida? Can't get eye contact, can't engage people, and nothing would have happened. They would have just kind of moved on. And so in verse 31... It says, meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. And in verse 32, but he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. I tried that on my wife once, and I went to bed hungry. Uh, <laughs> but he's telling his disciples, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then the disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? Listen to what he says in verse 34. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say four months more and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the harvest fields. They are ripe unto harvest. The food that we get that nourishes our soul, that nourishes our spirit, that builds us up, comes from the Spirit of God. As we are engaged doing the will of God, as we are in the presence of God, it says in Deuteronomy 8.3, Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but what? By every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's where our spirit is fed. That's where we are strengthened. In Isaiah, it says, even youths grow tired and weary, young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not grow faint at all. You see, so many of us are toiling all night and we're not getting anything of substance. We're toiling and we're not catching anything. But if we are walking in the Spirit, those small insignificant things, those mustard seeds that God plants along the way are going to feed us, are going to nurture us, are going to build us up in the body. God's work or ministry is not obvious to our natural man. It's easy to pass by. So if we're not sensitive, we're just going to pass it by and pass it by and pass it by. We find ourselves in that barren wilderness, toiling all night, wanting to be fed. Let's look how this story ends, as Paul Harvey says, the rest of the story 
He says that many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this man really is the Savior of of the world. Now stop and think about this story. Jesus was making what? A little pit stop. Came to the well, get a little water, get a little food, head on down to Galilee. You know, that was on the day timer. That was on the agenda. God's work in our life is often the things that we have not planned. Those are these unplanned events. He stayed two more days. This little pit stop turned into a two-day ministry, a two-day revival that this whole town of Samaria began to be ministered to. People began to be saved. And it all started with this encounter with this woman at the well. How many things in our lives can change by a little encounter that we did not plan, that we did not expect, but if we're sensitive to the Spirit of God, we can see incredible things. The most life-changing events in your life will be unplanned, at least by you. Ministry and life happens in the flow of God's will. Are you excited to see what God has for you? Think about 2015. We have no idea what's going to happen over the next 365 days. But do you know that God has things planned for you, preordained for your life? Open doors that you could not even imagine. Life-changing events that we might miss if we're not sensitive to the leading of his spirit. I'm going to share with you one of the uh, incredible, to me it was an incredible event, it was life changing, absolutely, and the more I distance myself from it, the greater this event becomes because it was so life changing and it was totally unplanned, unorchestrated, and there was nothing you know, bells and whistles and trumpets from heaven. It was just a very simple story. It was a very, you know, everyday encounter. But God changed it. Um, in 1985, when um, God spoke to me about going into ministry, and uh, I really sensed that this was God's call and direction for my life. I'm making plans, and I made applications to go to the Southwestern Seminary in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. And so uh, in the spring of that year, our church that I was going to, Sheridan Hills Baptist, they were doing a, a retreat. I guess there was a kind of a multi-church retreat up in Lake Placid. And so I'm up there with a bunch of my friends and uh, my cousin, uh, Mark. And so we're there, and there was one of the breaks, and I'm just kind of hanging out with the courthouse, or courtyard, and uh, Mark said, hey, why don't we all go horseback riding? And uh, I said, great, that'll be f wonderful. He had a big van. We're all going to pile in the van and uh, just go off and go horseback riding. And so I'm just waiting around. I'm kind of, you know, on vacation. I don't want to, uh, you know, get into anything heavy or whatever. I just want to enjoy myself. And so I'm standing there, and this guy is just standing there in the middle of the courtyard, and he just kind of looked. He wasn't homeless. He just, just kind of looked at a place, you know, kind of, a fish out of water, and the spirit just kind of, it, it was nothing big. It was just like, why don't you go talk to him? And I'm thinking, I'm fighting, no, Lord, I don't want to talk to him. You know, I, I want to hang out with my friends. I want to just, you know, go horseback riding. And so I'm going through this battle, and the Lord's saying, yeah, you really should go talk to him. So I was like, all right, I'll go talk to him. I'm going to talk to him. I'm going to go jump in the car and go horseback riding. So I go. I introduce myself. My name's Dan. His name was Joe. And um, 
where are you going? What you doing? You know, and he was just, um, just got there and the, the guy he came with was going to be sharing the message that night. And I said, that's great. And, uh, and then, you know how the Lord just kind of keeps speaking to you? He says, why don't you invite him to go horseback riding? And I'm talking to him and saying, no, I don't want to ask him to go horseback riding. You know, he'll, he's liable to say yes. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, here it is. Hey, would you like to go horseback riding? He said, oh, no, I've never gone horseback riding before. I said, okay. He said, but I'll go. <laughs> oh, oh, man. So we're in the van, and now, you know, I, I got to, uh, you know, I've befriended him. So, I, you know, I'm here. I'm talking to him. Come to find out that he was going to Southwestern Seminary in the summer. I was going in the fall. Before that day was over, we decided to room together. God had already provided a place for me to stay because he was going to find a house. He provided work for me because when I got there, he had already had a job uh, at a restaurant. And on top of all that, that's the same place where I met my wife, April, who was going to TCU, and she was working there as a waitress. All the things that God had provided for me was in that one small encounter, and I, in my flesh, would have missed it would have passed it by. You never know what God is going to do in your life if you're sensitive to the leading of his Holy Spirit. I mean, and as I look back on that, you know, nearly 30 years, I mean, not only did I meet my wife, you know, we, got, we're, we went from 2 to 11, you know, four kids, four grandkids, the spouses, our whole tribe. My whole life has totally been changed by that one encounter, and it would have been so easy for me to miss it. I would think if it was such a significant event, there should have been writing in the sky. There should have been some supernatural signs happening. But you know what? It's the still, small voice. How many divine appointments are we missing because we're not listening and we're saying, God, show me some great sign. God, help me. And he's saying, just be faithful in the little things. And so as you consider those doors that God desires to open for you, God has got great plans for each and every one of us. Let's look at the last point. God wants to put us in charge of great things. And there's a parable that Jesus told that kind of wraps it up. It's the parable of the talents. And when you understand the kingdom of God, it's more about what's coming than what is. What is right now is important. It's very important. But it's more about what's coming next. What's coming after this life. This life is preparation for the next life. The next life is eternal. This life is temporal. It's just like that little baby that's been in the womb for nine months. It's got its whole world, its whole universe, but once that baby comes out, it graduates into a bigger world and a bigger universe. And in the same way, when we pass from death unto life, when we go into eternity from the temporal, we are going into a universe and a world that we cannot even imagine. So Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God in this parable. And he says in verse 14, he says again, it, the kingdom of God, will be like a man going on a journey. Who is that man? That man is Jesus. In all his parables, he's always going off to a journey. He told his disciples, I'm going to go away for a while, but I'll be back. Kind of like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'll be back. He's coming back. And so he's going on this journey, and while he's gone, he called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another he gave two talents, to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents, I want you to get this, went at once. Went immediately and began to put it 
to work. The irony is that the most important day in the kingdom of God is today, is now, is the moment. None of us are guaranteed tomorrow. We may not be here tomorrow. The Bible says today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. When the Spirit is speaking, you, speaking to you today, right now, listen to the Spirit. Don't harden your heart. What I loved about Joseph as we were going through the Christmas story was that every time the angel spoke to him in a dream, immediately he got up and did it. When Herod was going to come and try and kill him and Mary and the baby, he said the angel came and warned him. He got up in the middle of the night. As soon as he woke up, he took the baby and they fled to Egypt. Today, now, when you hear his voice, harden not your heart. You don't know what door is going to be open. You don't know what God has intended. And so the man with the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one who had two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. I saw something new when I was reading that this week. You see, that talent that was given to him, it was something important. It was something valuable even to that servant. You see, if it wasn't valuable or important, he would have discarded it. He would have lost it. He would have just misplaced it. But it was important enough that he went and he found a place where he could bury it and come back and get it later. You know, it was one of those buried treasures that he had. So why did he bury it? Well, it was because he wasn't planning to do anything with it today. He wasn't planning to do anything with it right now. At some point in the future, he was going to go back, he was going to get that talent, and he was going to put it to work. But he probably figured, once I get my education, once I get my degree, then I'll have the time to really do the work that God wanted me to do. And so he gets out, and then it's once... You know, I get my career going. Once the children are raised, I can really put myself, devote myself to that things that God's are calling me to do that I've been putting off and putting off. You know, once I retire, I'm going to have all this free time that I'm really going to be able to do all the things for the Lord that I wanted to do. And every day just keeps passing and passing and passing. And then he retires. And then he says, you know what? I'm just too old, you know? Uh, I don't have the energy, I don't have to get up and go, you know? And all those things that happen, and they just keep putting it off. You know, I really think that's one of the enemy's greatest attacks, is that he knows how to keep us ineffective. He just keeps pushing us off, pushing it back. Another day, another week, next year, today, right now, there was a song by uh, Harry Chapin. It was called The Cats in the Cradle. I don't know if you remember that one, but it was The Cats in the Cradle, you know, and The Silver Spoon. And I think it started off something like this, that a child arrived just the other day. He came in the world in the usual way, but there were planes to catch and bills to pay. So he learned to walk while I was away. And then before I knew it, he started talking, and he said, I'm going to be like you, Dad. I'm going to be just like you. And the cats in the cradle and the silver spoon and little boy Boo and the man in the moon. When you're coming home, Dad, I don't know when, but we're going to have a good time then. We're going to have a good time then. And the song goes on through the child's, his son's childhood and the same things keep happening in his teen years, in his college years. And then finally, it gets to the end of the song when he's an old retired man and he said, and I called my son just the other day. I said, son, I'd like to talk if he can find the time. He said, oh, I'd love to, Dad. But the new job's a hassle and the kids are with the flu. But it's sure nice talking to you, Dad. It's been sure nice talking to you. 
And then the last line is that he says, and as I hung up the phone, it occurred to me, my boy was just like me. He grew up just like me. And the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon, little boy blue and the man in the moon. When you coming home? <laughs> Son, I don't know when, but we'll have a good time then. We'll have a good time then. And life can just pass us by. We can raise our family and miss the moments in time. We can miss so much of the life because we've missed the small things. We come up with the excuses. I want to read uh, one more scripture in Matthew 25, uh, or verse 21. Let's finish that out. Then his, uh, after a long time, his master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. Then the man who received the five talents brought the other five. Master said, you've entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge, listen to what he said, of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. You see, life today is all about a few things. Me being faithful in this church is about a few things. If this church was 10,000 people, it would still be a few things. Whatever you do, your work is about few things. Your family is about a few things. Everything that you do in this life is only about a few things. It's about what comes next. Those are the many things that we're to be faithful with. I'm going to share one more story and we're going to close. Abraham, if you want to get ready. Uh, back in 1990, uh, Hurricane Andrew blew through and it was probably the most devastating hurricane in modern history here in South Florida. It just devastated everything. And if you lived through that, you know what I'm talking about. But it was uh, Miami and Homestead and down in the Keys that got hit the worst. Well, there was this little church, probably not much bigger than ours, that was starting out there meeting in a schoolhouse. They had bought this big blue tent. They are going to do revivals or something with it. And right after the hurricane, they decided, well, let's try and help the people out in Homestead. And so they loaded up their truck, the pastor and I think his brother, and they uh, went down there. They went down the turnpike as far as they could so the roads were blocked. And on the right-hand side off the turnpike was an uh, uh, elementary school, I think a big uh, playground. And we just lost me. There, there we go. Um, and so uh, they, uh, they didn't know what else to do. They couldn't go any farther. They, there's an open area. So they put up the big blue tent. They put their cross there. And they thought, well, you know, as people come around and they need some shelter, we can provide a little bit of shelter for them. Well, about 20 minutes later, a big tractor trailer from Georgia comes down. A guy came with relief supplies, ice and food and different things. And uh, he couldn't get any farther down on the turnpike. He looks over. He sees this big blue tent. He sees the cross. And he wheels over. He pulls up alongside the tent. And he says, hey, can I... Uh, distribute my food here? And they said, sure, absolutely. And so people started gathering around and they start distributing food. And before you know it, another tractor trailer pulls up and uh, they start distributing food. More people start coming around. They start ministering to them. And then uh, the National Guard finally shows up and uh, they see the big blue tent. They see the cross. They see the tractor trailers. They see all these people. And uh, they say, you know, this isn't a bad place to start, sh set up headquarters. So they set up headquarters right there. And uh, then, of course, the local news comes in. And they start filming the uh, big blue tent and the cross and all the people. And uh, every night they're having a church service. They're ministering to the people. And then, wouldn't you know it, all the big... Uh, 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 TV, ABC, NBC, CBS, all the big uh, broadcasters, national broadcasters, they come, and where do they set up? They set up right there at the big blue tent with the cross, and all these people, and this became the uh, headquarters. And then, 
Uh, last but not least, George W. Bush, President 40, uh, 41, he decides to visit uh, the, the site and that's where he lands and that's where he visits all the people was there at the big blue tent with the cross and all the thing that became the headquarters for the national relief for Hurricane Andrew and all they did was go down there and they planted their little seed their little tent to try and help people out and God blessed it and uh, hundreds of people got saved uh, during those couple weeks they had to move down to um, Broward County and their church doubled and tripled within the time of a month or two and all they did was being faithful in the small things they had no idea no plan how God was going to do that you have no idea what God will do in your life God has the ability to change all things in our life amen let's stand I gave you a little extra since I missed last week so uh, <laughs> but if before we leave, if you need prayer, I can give you an opportunity because I want to tell you, God, He hears us by faith. He hears the cry of our heart. And whatever it may be in your life, if you need prayer, I'm going to invite you to come down for a moment or two before we close. So if you need prayer, come on down. <clears throat>